Welcome to Street Talk, S&P Global Market Intelligence podcast that offers listeners a deep dive into issues facing financial institutions and the investment community. This podcast was recorded on May 16th. I'm Nathan Stovall, and today we're talking about bank stocks, how the group has been hammered year to date, and whether or not we finally have found a bottom. Talk about all that. We're going to hear from an investor focused on the space who's been on the show before. Brad Rinchler, managing partner at Downrange Capital, and also joining Brad is his partner at Downrange, Connor Lapazetta. Connor, Brad, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Nathan. Thanks for having us on. Thank you, Nathan. Glad to be back. So, Brad, I want to wind back the clock to when we last spoke with you guys a, a little over a year ago, and you had pivoted from a pretty bullish stance on the space from when the fund had launched in the summer of 20, when the group was deeply discounted. And then I believe the phrase was that the group had run out of gas. And I also remember you saying that if you had sold bank stocks when they traded at 13 times earnings, you made money every time. What brings you, what brought you to that place? And was it sort of valuation simply alone or were you seeing things form in the group that got you kind of worried about where the fundamental performance was heading and how that was reflected in valuations. History plays played a big part there, but obviously we were at that point 12 years into a zero credit loss environment, which I felt was past expiration. Economically, I thought that some policy changes and stuff was going to was going to slow growth, at best slow growth, not kind of ignite some course course real estate losses. And they gave me no room at that point. If I can remember what I said, we did some work. By, I think 86% of bank stocks had buy ratings. I think the carry was somewhere between 73 and 74 when we when we did that podcast. And uh, you know, and when Johnny and I did the first one in 20 when we launched in the middle of COVID, the carry literally that the first day was or it was last week at like 36. So we've arrived back. Things have changed totally, right? There's a lot to talk about. That's, it's a pretty incredible squeeze, and, and a lot has happened, whether it's lifting all 500 basis points on, on the short end of the curve and, and doing so at the fastest pace you know, we've ever seen, and, and seeing a number of banks go upside down, but broadly seeing liquidity pressures really surface broadly across the space. But as you said, there's lots to talk about because it seems like some of the worst actions we've seen and worse actors who got upside down from an interest rate risk standpoint, most notably the three failures, are kind of being applied broadly to the whole group. Do you feel like that, one, that's fair? Do you, do you feel like the worst actors have have been flushed out at, at this point? Uh, or do you see that there's there's other shoes to drop in terms of the positioning of, of the industry? Or, or, or were those more outliers? The performance this year is based on those four, or you want to say three failed and one was liquidation. At the end of the day, they were, they were all gone, right? So those four, for us, was fairly easy, and we were very vocal and early there. Since we were, since we were pretty vocal, I've, we've got a lot of commentary on, you know, who's next, who's next, who's next, and we don't get into that game, right? Everyone wants me to comment on Pac West or West Alliance. I really haven't commented much on either, except pointing out some tidbits of some of the information that's been coming out. But for that that failed, each one had its own issues. And then we'll start with Silvergate. Silvergate was trading in the 30s and the work that we did there. I still stand by what I felt. It was amazing that the stock was trading 200. At least 85% of the bank analysts had buy ratings on it. Same guys had the buy ratings on it at 30. And there's so much questionable stuff that went on with this company. Who would ever invest in a company where CEO's son is the chief risk officer? She's CEO's Son-in-law is the chief compliance officer. I don't think that that's above board. Based a whole company around an industry that no one can question is very interesting, could be something big in the future for the world, but kind of built on kind of shady characters. Core of financial industry that's unregulated, and you're in the banking group that's one of the heaviest heaviest regulated industries in the world. Half your C-suite is inside your family. I, I don't know why we never questioned that. Right? No one questioned that. It's like, no, it's okay that everything's great because they're great. And Mr. Lane is great. I, I think you got to get your head out of your model and start connecting dots here. It, this one was easy, but he wouldn't answer the question with a wire from FTX that went to Alameda that blew both of them up and everyone lost their money. There was Both those accounts were at Silvergate. Did you guys do the wire? 
to an answer to that. So obviously we knew the answer to that. And then just basic AML, you know, know your customer rules. They're done. They're done right there. It didn't play out. This company had a very low loan to deposit ratio, the most a percentage basis liquidity on the balance sheet. And all of a sudden, they're putting on CDs at higher rates than the assets. And you saw it in that quarter where they're, they're not only not only did they have the lawsuits that could be coming, potentially you know criminal stuff, stocks still trading in the 20s. They put that earnings that's in the teens, and now they have a negative spread. And yet we still have analysts reiterating buy ratings. And it upset me because the amount of retail people that came out was like, well, you know, there's buy ratings here, there's buy ratings there. You know, you're wrong. And I'm like, you know, I don't know why. Because if you read analysts, the compliance on it, it's like a buy rating is, you know, going to outperform its peer group on a risk-adjusted basis over the next 12 months, 18 months, whatever whatever companies have. And it's like risk-adjusted. The risk in this is to zero. And it's, it's already zero, but we just haven't gotten there yet. So how can these things be buy rating? And then it's like, okay, you don't want to think that there's anything wrong going on. You don't want to talk about it, know your customer. I get it. When they, had a, when they had a negative spread, it's like, wait, that's a modeling. That's math right now. Like you have to talk about that and you can't discount that because that's not going to it's just going to work. And we saw that play out with the others, perhaps not as extreme. Right. But but it's it's a similar asset liability mismatch, elevated outflows relative to the rest of the industry. Everybody had two percent deposits to leave in 22. SCB, it was four X that signature above that. First Republic, not as much. But you got into that situation where they had a bunch of low yielding assets and a bunch of cash tied up in few deposits, and you ultimately saw it play out, maybe not as extreme example as you just laid out, but kind of play out in the same way, where you get closer to a place of negative spread. Signature had the same kind of construct. And then DePaolo De Paolo just up and quits, right? He's been the face of this franchise for two decades, just like, you know, decides to leave. Like every time I've seen a CEO kind of walk out when there's kind of some horns nests around, it's not long after there's, there's a knock at the door with guys in suit. That one was, that one was kind of easy as well. You go, you go to SVB, it's like, okay, there's some interest rate risk. There's some problems there. But I think this is user error on the investment bank that put this thing down so fast. We knew that the AOC air market knew all of that, and they forced these guys to take a loss. Okay, we're going we're gonna to realize the loss, and we're going to raise capital to cover it, but they did it the wrong way. I mean, they, they could have gotten the, the capital circled. You could have taken guys over the wall. You could have you know, obviously disclosed to them, listen, we're just going to you know, tighten up the balance sheet with this capital, and the capital secured, raise the capital, simultaneously you sell, the, sell the, uh, the securities, lock that in, and you're clean. But he sells securities without, without covering it. All of a sudden, there's no capital there. It's done. I mean, that that was it was it wasn't violent and it wasn't social media. It was any of that. It was just, hey, we want you to fill that hole, and they didn't have anything to fill with, and it was and they already dug it up. That one was interesting because there was no price at that point that they didn't want to pay for it. At any price, they I mean, they couldn't raise anything. So that that one was just bizarre. Then we started looking into it. I mean, the board came out and said, you know, we needed to have a more astute board. This wouldn't have happened. That's concerning to me. This is supposed to be one of the most high-tech banks ever. It's been the darling. I think that's one of the other problems. We've had four bank failures. They all traded at kind of crazy multiples from being kind of the scratch and dent bank guys that live in the space that we all know, including me. But the generalists love these. This is the generalist darlings. And guess what? Generalists don't really like banks. They may own three banks. They may own seven banks, whatever. Like guarantee you if they own five banks, three of them or three of them have failed. I think that's hard to get guys right now. They took them all to zero. So you you know, it's gonna be hard to find guys to generalist community come into the woodwork right now, especially given the landscape, to buy banks right. And FRC, FRC was never a great earner. This one got everyone got real emotional. But you know, I don't get really emotional on math. And math was this thing had a thirteen billion dollar crater in the middle of the balance sheet, and the CEO didn't believe in hedging. They just didn't like it. Didn't want to hedge. Guess what? They paid it. These are bad apples. Some fraud, undue interest rate risk. We need to put these guys down, set them aside, use them as examples. Don't dwell on them, and don't just kind of rip it apart. Every other bank that looks similar or may look similar, right? And who's the next? And the, the domino effect, right? You know, set those guys aside in a class, right? These guys are in a class. And are there other banks out there that took undue interest rate risk? I mean, that was obvious to us as this started to unfold, that banks that took undue credit risk have, you know, 
change that in for this time that is under interest rate. That being said, like you said earlier, regulators had banks every year do a shock, shock to balance sheet test, right? And they do 100 basis points, 200 basis points. And then everyone jokes, like, you just do 300 basis points, we'll never do it. But, you know, just do it just so we know, right? And then we just did 500 in a year. So if anyone really truly understands the long-term damage is on a bank's balance sheet, because what we just did on the interest rate side, they're lying. Because I don't know, and you don't know, and no one knows. But we know it's bad. And the concerning thing for me is the Fed knows it's bad. If the SC knows it's bad, and no one knows the answers to these questions, but we're still going to do it. So talking about the pivot, but the pivot, you know, the Fed's going to pivot. I never believed there was going to be a pivot. You know, speaking with my group and Connor, we're just kind of walking through how this is going to play out and down this kind of dark path. This guy's going to go till something breaks, and then he's going to stop. Well, I was wrong there because something broke, and then we're still raising rates. So you have this kind of perfect storm of kind of concerns over your bank because it's all over. So, you know, Everest is the 14th largest bank. Silvergate was this I think it was in every paper because it was so amazingly that the, what they built. The crypto guys were like, well, if silver, if silver gate's too big to fail. I'm like, no, it's not. But if, if it, it could take down the whole crypto industry, I'm like, so what? Sun's going to come up tomorrow. And that's the reality of it. But I mean, it, this, 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 this was impactful, right? But instead of blaming whatever you want to blame it on, you know, the, the math is the math and the facts are the facts. These are four bad companies. Well, I'll say I said that I've said this publicly too. Is you know if F, and FRC just hanging out there, you know it's all about we need to have the strength of the banking system, and you know we're concerned over this and that. I'll tell you what's concerning. FRC was done, but on Good Friday they come out and they give an earnings date with a with a conference call. So then here you go. Here comes the public. Brad, well obviously they're operating because they're gonna they're gonna have a conference call. And I'm like, what are they gonna say? I'm like, that's a smokescreen. I sound like an idiot by saying it's a smokescreen, but. You let these guys, so then they report, they say nothing on the conference call to show that they are still operating, and they, they fail the thing five, six days later. That's going to cause the public to instill confidence in the banking system. should have never happened. They should have failed that thing the Sunday before they were supposed to report on Monday and just put it to bed. They lost another $15 billion in deposits the week after reporting, so uh, it definitely didn't calm anybody and give a, faith in A couple of long only guys have come out. With comments saying, you know, kind of disputing. At the end of the day, these things don't get better. And there's only one thing. And FRC's stock performance, it outperformed what it should have. That thing should have been a dollar two. It should have never been fourteen dollars going into the earnings. It, it, you know, it, it should have been sitting down there at a dollar two, just waiting, waiting for the last bullet to fly. Well, and I remember I will say I saw you on Twitter, sort of saying anybody who thinks that this is anything but a zero is 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 dreaming. So Right. And, and, and listen, I, I wasn't trying to be I, I try not to get emotional over math that, that this one was this one was those four were easy, but you had to get couldn't read a research report because they were out to lunch on them. And I mean, there were a few guys that actually did get it. And more Stanley was early on, on Silvergate. They were, they were gone. That was great. But and you just had to connect dots here. And I, I think I said that in the last podcast, like, listen, you got to get ahead of any model. You start connecting dots on where. We are. And that's what we did. Well, maybe, Connor, if you could jump in a little bit and talk about how you guys were positioned, because you had said that you thought it was out of gas and that you thought the group was going to be overvalued. You know, whether or not you saw runs transpiring, you weren't quite clear. You thought valuations were off and we weren't preparing for what to come. Where, where were you guys positioned sort of heading in this year? And, you know, what, what has that done? from a performance perspective? Well, this year, we were obviously short some of the problem child banks. We were buying banks with very low valuations, strong deposits, good management teams, and good geographies that we thought would not be as exposed to the downside like this. And, and obviously, we pressed these four shorts as we saw more and more issues coming into the light. Right. So, I mean, just I'll expand on that a little bit, right? We had what did I say in, in March? I said, you know, we own meat and potatoes banks, right? We didn't want any high flyers, right? So that was, you know, I think our, our first short in SIVB was at $749. And I covered it like 300, 300 points early, and then we put it back on. But I think when the KRX was trading like 180 price tangible book and 14 times forward, our book looked like 105 or 110 and 10 times. 
And again, when, when this started to unravel, we've lived this before. You know, I've been doing this two decades. It was fairly obvious, you know, that this was going to get pretty ugly. We found our horses to uh, to ride, which has been really, really good. The, we've pivoted, though, right? And Connie, we're talking about how we've pivoted the balance sheet a little bit. I um, mean, uh, the, the portfolio. Yeah, for sure. So on the short side, beyond, beyond a couple special cases, we're not really meaningfully short banks at the moment. The short book currently consists of mostly digital lenders and commercial mortgage REITs. And we see significant deterioration in those companies over, call it the next 12 to 18 months. But the biggest change we've made is we own a lot more banks on the long side than we did three weeks ago. We believe that despite the issues we've seen in some of these institutions, the industry as a whole has been oversold. And we're finding quality banks down here at, frankly, ridiculous valuations. Now, I'll walk you through the one scenario where we're not, where I don't believe we're going to make money here. There's one scenario. It's a very small scenario that I don't believe is I believe that I would be buying banks. If I was an investor in a bank fund right now, seeing what I'm seeing, most likely from what we know about the industry and the, the investment managers hurt. If there's an investment manager that's operated through 2018 liquidity crisis, credit crisis, some of these, there's some, some managers that were in the SNL crisis in the 90s. Right? These guys, these guys have, have navigated for decades through this. And I wouldn't take my money out of the, 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 the investment manager, especially this, this, the bank specific guy right now, because the opportunity we're seeing, and in fact, they, they've been able to manage this. Yeah, it may not look good right now, but we happen to be in a little bit different case because how we had the balance sheet set up and then what we saw, and then just the windfall of those, right? So we were able to spin this portfolio. You know, we obviously had a small amount of banks that we liked. Uh, we still have the biggest position we have on the long side is G Bank, GBFH. That stock, I think, is up about 25% of the year. Uh, we think that is just a special situation, and we're going to be there for the long haul. How do we get here, right? So there's a few issues, right? Now you have some failed banks, so guys are getting nervous. But the real problem is, is that, you know, interest rates, right? So, you know, I, I, I sort of went into my bank the other day, and he's like, oh, Brad, you know, you know, can we get you in a staggered CD? And I'm like, I want to kick that guy in the, in the shin because – I can just go to the Treasury right now, go Treasury Direct, and get five and a half percent, five percent on a T bill, and I have daily liquidity. Sell it whenever I want. I don't have to lock up my money. That's what's going on here, right? When you have a competitor like that, I mean, that the T bills are one of the biggest threats to the banking system right now. So let's just say I'm a CEO and I have you, Nate. I have I have your commercial business and and you're checking and Connor's this, and Connor's another bank and he comes and. Hey, listen, if you want to refi away, we'll do 50 bips better on your, on your loan, 20 bips better on your money market. And most likely you'll say, thank you. You know, listen, let me just think about it. I'll call you in a couple weeks. And he calls me. Hey, Brad, I, just, I don't want to leave. Here's what I'm being offered. And I'll value Nathan's business and I'll match. And I'll say, you know, I'll give an extra 10 bips on the money market. And everything stays and we go about our business. Nate calls Connor back and says, hey, call me, call me in two years. Maybe we'll do something else. With the Treasury Direct, it's you know that's an ACH out of my bank. I don't know until it's gone, and I have nothing to offer Nate to get that money back. I'll say oh, I'll give you an extra fifty bits. So, well, I'm getting an extra two hundred and fifty with with T bills. You can't you right? can't match that rate. It can't, can't match the rate, right? But that's why we're seeing outflows. But but the one thing, and, and bankers will say this, and and perhaps you might agree with this that. That that's reflected in valuation, that, that theory that outflows are going to continue forever because it's purely driven by rate. But operating accounts aren't driven by rate. That's not the only thing of why you bank with somebody. And we have seen outflows, 2.5% year to date, but some stabilization here. Uh, and it creates issues. But if, as long as they're somewhat manageable, it's an earnings issue for most of these guys, right? Not a huge viability, safety, and soundness issue, whereas they're, it seems like a lot of them are trading on that. Right. So listen, we're operating a long short bank fund. You know, tapping out banks is not good for anyone's business, right? Tapping out the problem child to get past this thing, I think is 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 needed. As this thing's all unfolding and carries going from sixty five to fifty five to forty five to forty, now it's back to where John and I wants to fund in twenty in the middle of COVID when no one knows like if anyone's gonna even be alive. So looking at these things. So here's the criteria and you just said them at the operating account. So you know, we started seeing Especially, you know, I operated kind of for 20 years in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. So 
the first of all, I go home right away, right? I'm just going into the names that I know. I know, you know, every geography. I know some of the loans on that balance sheet. I know all the players, right? And it's like, oh, okay. So we're looking for we don't have any leverage on the balance sheet. So it's you know 95% or lower loan deposit ratio, significantly under book, have to have a buyback and dividend, 80% core funded, at least 25%. That's getting harder of non transparent deposits. But listen, good deposit gatherers. It's out there. And here we go. We're starting to find names that trading under 75% of book that had a yield at the beginning of the quarter of three. And it's now yielding seven. They're buying back stock. They have excess liquidity. I really don't want to look at AOCI marks there long. This is, that, this, that, this is a really troubling and upsetting conversation with banks when interest rates are zero. And you know, I'll give you an example on our phone. Three months ago, four months ago, Bank A, you know, they grow book about 5% a year annualized, and they take 26% hit the book in three quarters. And I'm like, guys, how can you do that? How can you take a five, how can you lose five years of book growth in three quarters when interest rates are zero, and they told you that they were raising rates, and then they gave you two months to hedge your book out, and you don't do anything. And it's like, well, Brad, you're looking at it wrong. And I'm like, how am I looking at it? He's like, well, we're going to get that back over the next six years. And I'm like, well, you're going to earn about four and a half million dollars in that six years, and I'm going to be dead by then when I get my book back. And I have investors that have to make money this year. So when I said, listen, we lost money on this investment, but don't worry, I'm going to get this back over the next six and a half years, they're going to somebody pound sand. So that's a real loss. It's not an accounting loss because here's the issue right now. Everyone's going to get an accounting loss, and you're going to get that back. Well, guess what? FRC is not going to get it back. And why FRC has got nothing, less than nothing. And that's why no one would even take it for nothing is because you have to realize that loss to take that company. And no one's going to say, oh, you know what? Listen, I think FRC has got a, a nice they have nice branches. So we'll take the 13 billion dollar hit up front just to take the company. That's not how this works. Right. So this is a real loss. And it's a loss that just baffles my mind, because if rates were at three and they went to seven, that looks me like, listen, we were set up. We thought rates going to zero. I may be kind of ticked off, but. I actually respect the guy for swinging the bat. But we were on the ground floor here. There's only one way we could have gone. And, like, we do nothing. It just seemed like this one was, like, this was a softball coming at you. He told us in the first quarter, uh, fourth quarter of 21, and in January of 22, he says, hey, we're going to start raising rates. And he starts doing it in March. Like, you had all of this time. You knew it was going to happen. Oh, we didn't think it was going to 500 basis. It doesn't matter. It's still going to be losses. Do something. Well, and, uh, and your point now, too, is that, yeah, most of the group has an underwater bond portfolio, but maybe not the same, right? They don't have the same duration risk that we saw here. But yet, as we sit here today, we're trading the the uncertainty associated with all of them is all kind of getting grouped together, it feels like to me. The one, the one area we haven't talked about that I'm sure you've looked at, and I'm curious some of your thoughts is around CRE. And what I've been talking to people about is that Sure, there is a, a problem there, but balance the potential loss content in commercial real estate on these books against their valuations today. It's not to say that there is no normalization in credit or there's not a big jump in credit loss, right? But from your standpoint, do you think that the great fears over CRE 1 are justified and 2 are are it, what you think the loss content is, do you think it's reflecting evaluations for most? Obviously, of when we're trading where we are here, you know, the risk reward is there partially. And listen, the, the Siri problems are a real issue here. And again, just like what we had in the interest rate risk, there's going to be guys that cut corners, guys that are putting up big growth in 21, 22 at the top here, problems. But what we're seeing, and let me get back to what Connor was saying, where we're seeing value on the short side, and where we think that it could be at best companies, especially these REITs, commercial mortgage REITs, is severely impaired or or they're going or they're leaving. They're just underwritten wrong, right? So like there's a there's a mortgage REIT on Long Island that has thirteen billion dollars. They just had they just had a huge loss. They said I think it may be the biggest foreclosure since since credit crisis, like four properties in Houston. You look at their balance sheets, like B properties all over the country, city, multifamily, $13 billion worth of, worth of loans out there, currently has a 77% loan to value, right? That's dead. Oh, and by the way, 
their, their refinancing see four and a half percent paper debt on the balance sheet to pay the dividend with eight and a half percent paper. So everything's going wrong here. And what's going to happen here is that they're going to have a loss. They're going to take They're going to take they're going to hit a bid on something in New York, Houston again, in L.A., in Memphis, where they are. And then we have to reprice everyone's stuff. So the guy so the bank that we love that's worse is 60 percent LTV. The neighboring property just had to hit a bid because these guys did some really bad stuff. I know this company very well, to them by name, but that that's that's that, right? They're gonna have to hit they're gonna hit a vulture bid, and then we have to reprice kind of what the market is. So this can unwind unwind there, right? Re, you know, really quick. So I think the gross real estate problem is is real. And here is the one I said there's one issue. The one issue I have that I'm not gonna make money buying banks at these levels is that we don't have this liquidity problem and this deposit problem and this who's next problem buttoned up when this commercial real estate state and then we have to sort of deal with both of these things. That's the one path that this that it's been 20 years and I don't like talking about it. It's the first time I've ever seen this road. It's a road that we don't want to go down in the US banking system. And it's a road that we can turn onto. I'm not on it. Obviously I'm buying banks. But we have to be aware that we, we, we can't be scared to talk about these things because they're out there, right? So that's never going to happen. Well, it might. I don't think we're going to get here, right? That that is that is the one major concern I have. I think it's a lower probability. I believe in capitalism. I believe in this country, but it's there now, and I've never seen it in 20 years. That is that's that's the one thing that's going to keep me up at night. I need we need to get this thing fixed and discuss this. But one of the things is one. There's real value here for investors that are out there, been with bank financial services focused funds, they're seeing their statement and not happy, seeing what's going on, seeing that this bank is failing. Say, why am I investing in a bank fund? This guy is we've been here before, right? This is this is banks are cyclical. We'll get back to our roots and we'll make money. I mean that that's that's what I truly believe. But public is freaking out right now. I mean, I give you, you know, the other day when there was that bear raid, which is illegal. On the options market, when they went after all the regional banks, I don't know who that was, but Piercy side of me thinks it's a foreign sovereign wealth fund or something like that, hitting the op- options exchange all at once and creating this synthetic long, which panics out. I mean, I get a phone call from my mid 70s mother. It's like, hey, Brad, you know, uh, you know, is my bank safe? I just want to make sure my money's good, right? Like, I'm thinking she's crazy. And I thought about it. I was like, no, that's what everyone's thinking. That's what everyone that's not involved in our business is thinking, because the only thing the public has to, to, to rate the health of their bank is the action of their stock price. So we got to get past this. And I'm happy that FRC failed. You don't have to deal with this thing anymore. And it, the truth is, like I said, if it was a $2 billion bank, they would have shot that thing the first night that this thing was a problem. But it was so big and it was so messed up, they didn't know what to do with it. That's and and that and that's made everyone else time to catch up and say this one's next. This one looks like this one. This guy has interest rate. This guy has negative equity. If you do this and that and this, that's not really the math that we got there to get there. Uh, and again, perception can come re- become reality. But I believe in the U.S. banking system. I believe that the weak fish will be eaten just like last time. And the ones that are going to go, that's still out there. A lot of us know who they are. You know, they just kind of roam around blind cattle until someone decides to put them down. They're not systemic. You play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. And uh, you're seeing that now. It's unfortunate because I guess I guess a decade or 12, 13 years since the last problem. You know, you always feel like you, you know, you're supposed to you know, learn from your mistakes. But, you know. They just seem to morph in other places. But there's some real value in banks. I, I think that's a great place for us to leave it. Contrarian again at, at this point, not seeing a lot of a lot of people dedicated to uh, a lot of people willing to go long space. So uh, I know plenty of uh, our friends in the system will be happy to, to hear that. Well, thank you, Brad, Connor, for coming back uh, and, and talking about your view. We're trying to be right again, man. Thank you for having us. And good luck to everyone out there.